Good evening. Good evening. And good to see you all here on a Sunday evening. Hope you had a good day. It was a nice day, pretty day. And uh, glad you made your way back to be in the Lord's house tonight. What a good day we've had. And another thanks goes out to all that had a part in our student ministry uh, singing this morning, the Easter music. Was it beautiful? It really was, and meaningful, and you did a great job. All the leaders and kids, uh, there are a few of them here tonight. Y'all did a good job this morning, wonderful. And the Lord was honored, and that's what counts. Well, if we have anybody visiting tonight, we want to make them feel welcome. I uh, don't believe so, but good to see all of you here, and good to see the good fellowship before we are getting underway. In the bulletin, there's a lot of things, and... Please get you a bulletin if you don't have one, and you'll find out about some things um, to put on your calendar and be aware of and hope that you will be a part of. Let me mention something we, I don't think, mentioned this morning, just so you'll be praying for the family. Donna Pendergrass lost an aunt in West Virginia, and she and Scooter were uh, gone up there today. It's the reason we haven't seen them. They'll be making their way back either today or by tomorrow, tomorrow early, I think. But uh, that's where they are, and pray, pray for the, uh, the family, the Pendergrass family. I do not have the lady's name, but uh, that went across the prayer chain, but just want to make sure everybody knows. So you'll pray for them, and I know that you will. Ladies are going to have an event, and we're having a church-wide potluck luncheon, and all this is coming up in April, so that'll be here just around the corner. And then we have yet, uh, two weeks from today, our adult choir uh, for the Easter music, and that'll be in the morning, and looking forward to that very, very much. I want to just say a word about you, Doc. Thank you for being such a loving and skillful shepherd of us as your choir. You know, sir, I didn't hear you. Well, I know you consider it an honor, but I want you to know how much we appreciate you, and I wanted the congregation to know that we do appreciate your leadership. And I started to say something in choir, but I thought, no, I want everybody to hear this. I preached this morning about a loving heart. If you were here, you remember that. And I was just thinking, the Lord laid strongly upon my heart. This is an example, the way you treat us in choir practice, of what love is like. And it's just good to be on the receiving end, brother. Well, we hope you feel that way. You are loved, and we feel loved. And that's the way it should be in the family of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Russell's going to be leading our song service tonight. Thank you, Russell. You've picked out some hymns of grace, and we're going to sing along. Choir's going to back you up, and you're all ready to sing. But before we do, let me read our memory verses of the week having to do with Christ returning to earth. We know he is coming back, and these, among many verses, remind us of that. These are from the uh, ESV, English Standard Version. Colossians 3 and verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Revelation 22, 12, Jesus says, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. And then Titus Chapter 2, verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of those should cause our hearts to swell with gratitude and increase and strengthen our hope. Hope makes life better, doesn't it? We know we're on our way toward heaven. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord so that we can worship him. And you might say, tune up 
for heaven. We're getting ready. This is practice for heaven. So let's bow together in prayer, and then Russell's going to come. Good evening. Good evening. If you'd stand with us, and we'll come to the Lord in song. I tried to pick out some Resurrection Day theme music for this evening. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men. is the power of the cross and hymns of grace. It's number 272. Sin for us, He took the 
song right now is Hallelujah, What a Savior. I think it's new to us. I don't know if we've ever sang it before, um, but it's not a new song. Uh, it was written in the 1860s or 70s by a guy named Philip Bliss, and he was on a train with his wife, and he was 38 years old, and they went across a bridge. Um, he was a student of Moody, I believe, but uh, uh, the bridge collapsed. And um, he survived the crash, but his wife was still in the wreckage. So we went down to get his wife, and then the train burst into flame, and they both died. But what a testament. I don't know if you've ever heard this song. I hope I can get through it. Um, it's, uh, it's a powerful uh, piece of music. Um, and what a testimony to the man who lost his life, saving his wife when he was 38 years old.
Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day, your day. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come before you. And Lord, what a savior you are to take the filthiest of sinners and wash them clean and usher us in to glory with you. Lord, we're so grateful. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Josh as he brings us the word. Pray that you'd open up our hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, amen, I'm thankful today that our focus has definitely been on Christ and specifically his resurrection. So let's uh, open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 as we continue our study through the greatest sermon ever preached. We embarked on a journey, I believe it was uh, three, three sermons ago, and we started to look at righteousness. And as we well know... Uh, Christ looks at three areas of righteousness. He looks at righteous psalms giving, righteous praying, and righteous fasting. So let's start our reading tonight in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. Matthew 6 and verse 5. Christ says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen, heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of. Before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye. Our father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Tonight we're considering in our series that we've called the divine call into righteousness, we're considering righteous praying. Righteous praying. We're talking about the right way to pray to our Heavenly Father. You know, praying is a thing of the past for many professing Christians. Um, stats may show that Pew Research claims uh, out of their study done 2023 into 2024 that only 79% of professing Christians in the U.S. pray every day and some of them are just once a day and sadly and I say sadly because I've worked with students 
for many years now, and, and I think this is true, the younger that you get, the less you pray. And so I hope that we can curve that trend, not only in my own family, but in our own church. But the sad reality is that not all professing Christians pray. And if we go a little deeper, many of the prayers of those who call themselves saints, many of the prayers that they pray do not line up with what we see here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. So we must ask ourselves, what is wrong? What in the world is going on? Is it that God no longer needs to hear from his people? Actually, he never has. He does not, and, and never will he ever need anything. That was a double negative almost. Could it be that, that we've not modeled godly praying at home? Maybe. Could it be that families are so busy in this world, this fast-paced world, that we don't make time to pray? That we don't make time to teach our youngins at home how to pray. So what are we to do? Well, as you research through history, what you will find is every great revival, the Reformation, the Great Awakening started in the pulpit. We must start preaching, praying. We must preach how to pray. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to preach about praying, righteous praying specifically. So as we start to embark on this journey, the first thing I want us to consider out of this text is a divine warning against hypocritical praying. A divine warning against hypocritical praying. And I say it's divine because we must not forget that Jesus Christ himself is preaching this sermon. These are words straight from the God-man. Straight from our Savior. So as all the words in the scripture. Yes we must heed all of them. We must specifically heed these. We must dive in deep. We must read these. Because they are life changing. So just by way of review. If you go back to chapter 6 and verse 1. As we embarked on this study. We learn that the word used for alms in the King James translation in verse 1, verse 1 was dakayas une, and it's best translated as righteousness. We're speaking about the right thing to do, that, that which is deemed right by the Lord, and that is the introductory verse for verses 2 through 18. This is the, uh, me and uh, Brother Russell was talking about how the, how that men think in boxes sometimes. And in my mind and, and in this sermon series, this is the overarching box from which we have three different subdivisions, almsgiving, praying, and fasting. So in this middle subdivision of this greater teaching on righteousness, we're speaking of the right way to pray. So if you look back to verse 5, it says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Christ, again, just as he did back in verse uh, 2, he comes right out of the gate and he calls out the hypocrites. We would say he come right out of the corner swinging. He swung open this door and is bringing all attention to what the hypocrites were doing and how the hypocrites were praying. Hypocrites, or hypocrites in the Greek, speaks of an actor, or it speaks of a pretender. And the literal definition would be an actor hiding behind a mask. We're talking about a two-faced person, a person from which their profession does not match their practice. We're speaking of a person who says one thing, but yet they do another. So Christ is calling all those out who hypocritically pray. Now the word used in the original manuscript for pray here means to exchange wishes. You see, that's what we do when we pray. We are exchanging our human wishes, our imperfect wishes, for that of which God desires, for that of which is divine. That's what praying is. 
And also, if you look at prayer, you will find that, that prayer and the Greek word for faith, pistis, in the, in the New Testament, are closely related. And, and we would say, well, well, yes, of course. Because if we have real, genuine faith, we will pray. We will pray. So Christ is giving a divine warning against praying that is hypocritical. Now, as we start to embark on this study, and I must confess, this is going to be a several uh, sermon uh, series study on praying. You just can't look at the Lord's Prayer in one sermon. There's no way to look at that. You can't look at, at, at verses uh, 5 all the way to the Lord's Sermon and, and a few sermons either. This is deep stuff as we start to consider the greatest sermon ever preach so as we think about hypocritical praying we must step back in time we must step back and see what prayer meant to those in the first century we must step back and specifically paint a picture of what Jewish prayer looked like because if you remember it was the Jews that Jesus was primarily speaking to on that hill that day on the mount as he preached this greatest sermon that was ever Preach, And I want to do this using some research by some uh, well-known guys like William Barclay, MacArthur, others, and some research that I have put together that I think that will paint the picture of what uh, Jewish life looked like concerning prayer. And I'm going to do this by just several statements, and we'll sort of do them uh, shotgun style. Uh, you can write them down if you want. First of all, Jewish prayers, they were ritualized. Jewish prayers were ritualized. If you look at Jewish prayers back in the first century and really leading all the way up to today, you will find that the wording and the forms of these prayers, they were set. We started talking about those boxes at the beginning of the sermons. Jewish prayers were prayed in a box, a predetermined set box, a predetermined form from which you would pray, a predetermined method to pray. They were repeated a lot of times from memory, or these prayers could be read. They could be said with little attention from what was being prayed. And what did this lead to? This led to a routine, semi-conscious, just a religious exercise type of prayer. The Jewish prayer life, specifically in the first century, it would consist of repeating the Shema. You've heard of the Shema, most of you have. it. It's the Jewish confession of faith. They would repeat it early in the morning and they would repeat it again at night. The prayer began, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then they would go into saying selected verses and selected phrases from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21, and Numbers 15, 37 through 41. They would say those phrases unless. They were running short on time. You see, there was an abbreviated, approved version of the Shema that consisted of the opening statement and then selective phrases from just Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Now, a Jew would not only say the Shema, but they would say the Shemone Esrei. And it's also known as the 18. This prayer consisted of 18 different prayers. Prayers for different occasions. Faithful Jews, they would say all 18 in the morning, all 18 again in the afternoon, and then all 18 again in the evening. That is unless you in a hurry. And uh, Jewish tradition, Jewish law also allowed you to say a abbreviated version of the Shemone Esrei uh, for that prayer as well. So both the Shema and the Shemone Esrei were, were to be said every day, no matter what. The devout Jew, whether they were working, whether they were traveling, whether they were, they were visiting, whether they were crossing the street, whether they were going to whatever they, they had going on that day, a devout Jew would stop at the appointed times of prayer, which were 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock noon, 3 o'clock p.m., and they would pray. And sadly, many of the Jews of the day, they limited their praying to just these times. Now, we don't need to cast too many stones at all Jews because some of the Jews prayed 
from a committed heart. Some of the Jews said these prayers in the right way. Some of these Jews said these prayers from their heart. Yes, they would pray at the prescribed times, but that was okay. We find the apostles doing that in the New Testament. You can look back specifically to the book of Acts. Remember those phrases? It was at the time of prayer that they would pray. It's okay to pray at these prescribed times. And many of the Jews would pray, and they would mean their prayers. But if you look at Jewish prayer life, it was, first of all, a ritualistic prayer life. Secondly, Jewish prayers were long prayers. They were long prayers. The rabbis, the Jewish rabbis of the time, students, that's the Jewish teachers, that we could say the Jewish preachers of the day, they taught that a prayer's sanctity and a prayer's effectiveness was in direct correlation to the prayer's length. They taught that the longer the prayer was, that the more likely that it would be heard and heeded by God. I ran across a a statement that MacArthur said relating to these long prayers, and he said, and I quote, verbosity was confused with meaning, and length was confused with sincerity. You see, Jewish prayers were long prayers. So they were ritualistic prayers. Jewish prayers were long prayers. And then Jewish prayers were also repetitive prayers, repetitious prayers. They would add adjective after adjective before God's name in their prayers. They would actually have a a competition. If they were praying out loud, this person would see how many adjectives they could use to describe God the Father. And then this one over here would see if they could beat it. And they would have this sort of uh, prayerful competition between one another. They liked repetition. And they used this repetition as a way to somehow uh, make God hear them or, or whatever they were thinking. So Jewish prayers were repetition. Lastly, Jewish prayers were visible prayers. They were visible prayers. They wanted to be seen. The Jews wanted to be heard when they prayed, specifically the hypocrites. And it's this fault that Christ keys in on. It's this fault that he has honed in on in our passage tonight. And and that is what we will consider as we um, consider this heading, this divine warning against hypocritical Praying, And as we do that, I want to look at two different statements about how the hypocrites pray. The first one being, hypocrites pray to be seen. Hypocrites pray to be seen. Look back to verse 5 of our passage. It says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. And when you first read verse 5, some people want to automatically key in on the fact that these hypocrites prayed standing in the synagogues. And these hypocrites prayed standing in the street corners. And that's an issue. Because neither one of them, neither one of those statements, standing praying in the synagogue or standing praying in the street corner, is the issue here. You see, the Bible presents three main postures of prayer. You can pray kneeling, you can pray laying prostrate on the ground, and then you can pray standing. Standing was an acceptable posture of prayer. And out of the three, standing was the most common posture of prayer. So praying while standing is not the problem, especially praying while standing in the synagogue. Because if you was a Jew and you was near the synagogue, or you was near the temple, you would go there to pray. You would go there at 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock to pray at those appointed times of prayer. Any devout Jew would do that. So praying in the corner of the street and praying standing in the synagogue is not the issue. The issue is found in that last phrase. It is that they may be seen of men. They may be seen, one word, feino in the Greek, and it means to bring to light or to cause to appear. In our text, a literal definition of this word would be to pray to meet the eyes, praying to, to strike the sight. 
praying in plain sight for the goal of being clearly seen. You see, what Christ is condemning here is ostentatious prayer. He's condemning praying to attract attention. He's condemning praying to to draw a big crowd. He's condemning praying to put on a show. And why would they do this? Well, think about who it was that Christ called out time and time and time again throughout the Gospels. He called out the hypocrites. He called out the religious leaders. You see, these religious leaders, these hypocrites, would pray standing in the synagogues, and they would pray in the corners of the busiest streets so that they could be seen and so that they could be heard. They made a point to go to the synagogues. They made a point to go to the busiest places in the streets, make sure they were there at the right time so that that when the hour of prayer prayer came, they could pray so that they could be seen which in turn helped them validate their positions. You see, how they were acting were not validating their positions biblically at all. So they had to validate their positions through this praise of men, through being seen of men. They used prayer as a stepping stone to help raise themselves above everyone else. They used prayer as a tool to stoke the fire of their power and their religiosity. They they turn prayer into nothing more than a sinful way to gain earthly attention from men. They prayed to be seen of men. Turn over to Luke chapter 18, a well-known passage. Luke chapter 18, we find the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Another well-known parable, Luke 18. I want to begin reading. In verse 9, and I want us to key in on how the Pharisee acted. Luke 18, beginning in verse 9, it says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Christ says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood... And prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee, that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Exalted. So, so we see here in this parable that the Pharisee stood. He stood not in some far-off corner. He stood not at some considerable distance away from the front, like the publican did, this Pharisee stood right in the front. He stood right in full view so that everyone could see him, so that everyone could hear him. Someone could make the argument that this is still okay to be standing like this, which you could agree with that until you read the Pharisee's arrogant prayer. The arrogant prayer that he prayed in front of everyone. You see, he only desired to be seen of men, not heard of God. It was a self-centered, man-focused, a prayer that used the pronoun I way too many times in a prayer to our holy God. This prayer dishonored the Lord. Now turn back to our passage in Matthew chapter 5. Because what we see in Matthew chapter 5 is we see this type of prayer prayed, and then we see the reward for this type of prayer. Look at Matthew 5, towards the end, last statement. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Here we see the same phrase that Christ used back in verse 2 to describe the reward waiting those that hypocritically give alms He uses that same phrase to describe those who hypocritically pray. 
And what is the reward? What is the reward for hypocritically praying? Christ is promising a reward. There's no doubt. But it's not a heavenly reward. He is promising that hypocritical praying will be rewarded with that which a hypocrite with that which the hypocrite praying desires in the first place, that is the praise and worship and the celebration of man. And as was in the reward for those who hypocritically give alms, this is as far as that reward goes. You see, again, that expression, they have their reward, is a technical expression used in that day to describe a complete business transaction again what we use the term paid in full in today's talk so Christ is saying that prayers prayed for the reason to be seen of men they will be paid in full but they're going to be paid in full here on earth by the celebration and the praise and the worship of men and that's it that's as far as those rewards goes there will be No heavenly rewards for hypocritical praying. So hypocrites, first of all, pray to be seen. Secondly, hypocrites not only pray to be seen, but they pray to persuade. They pray to persuade. Look at verse 7. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. The first phrase I want us to look at is that phrase, use vain repetitions. And it's one word in the Greek, and it's batalegeo. Batalegeo. And and it means to repeatedly utter empty words. It means to stammer long-windedly. It's a very interesting interesting word. It's an onomatopoetic word. Word and one of those words is like buzz. Okay, uh, when you try to describe how a bee flying through the air, how is it spelled? B triple Z, B Z Z Z. Okay, that's an onomatopoetic word, and that, that's just what this word is. Bata legeo. And if you look at the do a word study on it, what you will find is this word actually has its roots. Uh, the Jews would hear uh, the heathen come to their towns, and they would be talking uh, languages that the Jews did not understand. And all that the Jews said that they heard was bata la bata 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 bata. And so it come this phrase come up to say bata legeo was vain repetitions. You see, the Jews. Even though they hated the Gentiles, the Jews called on to what the Gentiles did in their prayers. Because what was it that the Gentiles did? They prayed reputitious prayers. The Gentiles would jabber and jabber and jabber and jabber some more. They would repeat the same thing over and over and over again to their false God's. The Gentiles believed that the value of their prayer was not found, uh, well, it could be found in the length of it, but also in the repetition of it. Christ, at the end of verse 7, calls out the fact that the hypocrites think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now, now who is he talking about? Be heard of who? They thought that they were praying to God. These goofballs thought that God would hear them because their prayers were full of many words. They believed that they could persuade the God of the universe with words from his creation. This again has its roots in the heathen. It has its roots in the Gentiles. This is exactly what the Gentiles did. Turn back to 1 Kings. We've been looking at the story of Elijah. And when Elijah went up against the prophets of Baal, there on Mount Carmel, Elijah went up against them. In 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 26, we'll just read four verses here. 1 Kings 18 and verse 26, and I want us to key in on this reputitious, long prayer that the heathen prayed to the false god, of Baal, 1 Kings 18, beginning in verse 26. Just to set the scene, Baal and Elijah, they're up on Mount Carmel. They've built their altars. 
And now it's uh, the prophets of Baal's turn, 450 prophets of Baal. They're going to cry out to Baal to send fire to burn up the sacrifice. Beginning in verse 26, it says, And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning unto noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or, or he is in a journey or poor adventure. He sleepeth and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances, lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past. Remember they started that morning. And they prophesied until the time of offering of the evening sacrifice. Now we have went all day that there, was neither, that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. So here we have the prophets of Baal crying out, O oh, Baal, hear us. They went as far as cutting themselves to the blood gushed out. And what they found out is no matter how many times that they repeated their prayer, Oh, Baal, hear us. Baal never heard them. Why? Because Baal, of course, was not real. We have another example of this type of repetitious praying over in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 24. Acts 19 in verse 24, we find the story of Demetrius, the silversmith, and how that Demetrius, he aroused a whole crowd to come against Paul and his companions. And I want us to pay close attention to what happened towards the end of this account. Acts chapter 19, I want to begin our reading in verse 24. Acts 19 in verse 24, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana brought no small gain into the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands." So that not only this our craft is in danger to be said at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnific magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he should not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing. And some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand, and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, here it is, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So for the space of two hours, they cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You see, this crowd was aroused against Paul and his companions because they had preached the gospel and it had permeated throughout all of Asia. So what did those who had been converted do? They threw away their shrines. They destroyed their shrines. They destroyed their false gods. And that was taken Demetrius as in the silversmith's uh, income from them. And it made them mad. They aroused this crowd. And when Paul and them were brought before them, and they couldn't do anything to them because he was a Jew, 
what happened? They cried out for two hours straight. Again, vain, repetitious prayer. Babbling on. For two hours straight, they repeated, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. The point we're trying to make is that Christ calls out the hypocrites back in Matthew chapter 6 for praying prayers full of vain repetitions and empty words because they mean nothing to him. They mean nothing more than a prayer prayed for two hours by some silversmiths who were mad and some Diana worshipers who were mad who cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. These vain, repetitious prayers mean nothing to God. You can't persuade the God of the universe with anything, much less vain babblings. Our God is unchangeable. Therefore, he's unpersuadable. So do the Buddhists who spin wheels containing written prayers, believing that with each turn of this wheel that their prayer is heard, they must know that that is nonsense. To the Roman Catholics who light their prayer candles and believe that their prayers will ascend to the throne room of God until the candle burns out, they must know that that is a vain prayer. The Charismatics who will repeat prayer after prayer or word after word or phrase after phrase until they work themselves up into a frenzy and work all those around them up into some out-of-this-world frenzy must know that that's not how God operates. We who are guilty of repeating, maybe not as bad, but repeating the same thoughtless, indifferent prayers to God need to know that that is offensive to him. Christ is calling out the sin of thoughtless, vain, and repetitious prayers. And you might think, how could I fall into this category? Well, how many taught our children, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I shall die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's an okay prayer. But how many of us said it just to be saying it? How many of us said it with no thought? How many of us said at the dinner table, and, and God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. Thank you, Lord, for our daily bread. Amen. Nothing wrong with that prayer. But how many of us prayed it just to be praying? How many of us taught our children the meaning of that prayer? It's convicting. How many times we've fallen into this category? Christ is calling out vain and repetitious prayers. Prayers that seemingly try to persuade the God of the universe. Hypocrites pray to persuade so in this divine warning against hypocritical praying, we've learned that hypocrites, they pray to be seen, to be seen of men. Hypocrites pray to seemingly persuade God Almighty. Now let's consider the convicting application, the convicting application. As we study through this text, you know, we must ask ourselves, are we guilty of this type of praying? And the, and the striking thing to me, as I was studying this, is that no prayer is so hallowed that our three enemies, the devil, the world, and the flesh, will not try to invade. If you remember, it was in Jesus' deepest time of prayer, his deepest time of communion with his heavenly Father, that the devil tempted him the most. It was at his most vulnerable point, humanly speaking, his most vulnerable point that the devil himself attacked him. So we must not think for one moment that our prayer is some super protected time. Don't you dare think that if you're in a hard situation that, that you can pray the devil away. 
The devil is going to attack, so we must guard our prayers. And there's two questions we must ask ourselves. As we've looked at this passage, we must ask ourselves these two questions in order to apply it. First of all, what is the motive of our prayers? What is the motive of our prayers? Remember, Jesus Christ, the one who bled and died on Calvary for us, the one who took his, our sins upon himself on that cross, is calling out those who pray to be seen of men. You see, their motive, the underlying motive, was that they wanted to be seen the same way that an actor is seen on a stage. So we must ask ourselves, why is it that we pray? Do we desire to pray in the most public places so others will see and hear us? Do we pray to be seen of men, or do we pray to commune with God? You see, this is what prayer is. It's a special time when our sole focus must be to commune with the one who gave us life. Yes, we make requests. Yes, we praise Him. Yes, we repent of the sins that we've committed against Him. But in all of this, He is the motive not others. So what is that driving force behind our prayers? Is that driving force to please others or to please God? Is that driving force to check the box off of our to-do list? Is is that driving force, is it just because we want to get something from God or we want to give something to God? Is the driving force To please those around us. Or do we have a pure motive? A motive that is fixated on communing with God the Father. What is the motive of our prayers? Secondly, not only what is the motive of our prayers, but what is the goal of our prayers? If you think back to our text, the goal of those who prayed these hypocritical prayers was to persuade God through these vain reputations, through the useless babbling. Remember, batalegao, to persuade God through this useless babblings. So when we pray, do we try to use as many super spiritual words as possible in order to try to win over God's favor? When we pray, do we try to repeat the same word or phrases hundreds of times as if God is going to finally get tired and just give us what we want? You see, the problem with with too many people is that their prayers are nothing more than a sales pitch that is trying to persuade the God of the universe who owns everything anyway that he needs something from us. When in all reality, our praying, Our prayers, our sole aim, our sole goal would be that God the Father would persuade us through the transforming power of His Word and the inner working of His Spirit to change us and to conform us to the image of Christ. You see, the goal of our prayers must be the Lord's will and not ours. Friends, if we're going to apply this message, if we're going to apply what we've heard tonight, our prayer life should be motivated by the opportunity to commune with God the Father. And our sole goal should be that God conform us to the image of His Son. That God sanctify us through the working of His Spirit and through His Word that cuts to our heart. But the truth is, as always, with every text that we look at, the truth is that many don't heed the word of God. Many do not pray like this. Many do not pray at all or or many pray very little because they've never been truly saved. There's so many people who profess to be saved but fail to commune with the one who saved them. That doesn't even make sense. I mean, the Lord gave us a brain, a brain that can logically think. And if someone was willing to die for us, 
we would have a relationship with them. That's what prayer is all about. It's that daily communing relationship with our Heavenly Father. But many don't do that. And why? Because they're not truly saved. So if this is you or, or maybe you know someone who don't pray at all. They don't need to be taught how to pray. They need to be shared the gospel. They need the life-saving power of the gospel. They need to be told that, that Jesus Christ was sent by God the Father to live a perfect life. To die a substitutionary death on the cross. They need to be told that on that cross the wrath of God was put upon Christ because the sin of all those that would ever repent and believe was put on Christ and Christ had to suffer for that sin. They need to be told that if they will repent and believe and confess Jesus Christ as Lord that they will inherit eternal life. That the Holy Spirit would come inside of them and would ha take up a permanent dwelling place in them and help them pray as God desires them to pray. They need the Lord, not instruction on how to pray at first. You see, they need to know. They need to know that they need to intimately know the Father, that they need to have a relationship with Him because only then Will the motive and the goal of their prayer. And only then is the motive and the goal of our prayer. God. May God help us to righteously pray. Bow with me. Father. We come to you once again as we do. Sunday night after Sunday night. Sunday morning after Sunday morning. Wednesday night after Wednesday night. We come to you as a broken people. Lord, every Christian that is in this sanctuary here today, every Christian that may be listening to the live stream later on, every one of us know that we don't pray as we should. Every one of us know that we don't pray as often as we should. Every one of us know that we don't pray with the right attitude all of the time. Lord, the more that we learn about you, the more that we realize that we are sinners. That are in constant need of your grace. Lord I pray. That as we study through this wonderful passage. That we would. Learn how to pray in a way that honors you. That we would. Refrain from hypocritical praying. That we would run. From praying with vain repetitions. That we would put aside babbling on and on and on. But Father I pray that we would realize. That our prayer life is such a special time. A time when we get to commune with you. The one who gave us everything. Through your son Jesus Christ. Lord I pray if there's anybody here in the sanctuary. Lord that don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray that tonight would be a night. That you would do whatever it takes to break them. That you would do whatever it takes to bring them to their knees. Lord to humble them. Lord, to show them that, that they are sitting in the hands of an angry God. A God who has wrath pinpointed on them. A God who has them in the crosshairs. And Lord, take this and use it to draw them to you. Through the working of your spirit in their soul. Lord, bring them to a place of repentance. Lord, bring them to a place of belief and faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Bring them to a place of confessing Him as Lord. Lord, we know salvation is only possible through you. And we call upon you to do that. Lord, we want your will to be done. It's in your Son's wonderful name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand, we'll have a time of invitation. And I encourage you, whatever's holding you back, whatever's holding me back from fully serving the Lord, from praying as we should. I pray that we would take care of that here in just a moment. Hymn of invitation is Lamb of Glory.
What a song to end the night on. I'll ask our pastor to come up, and I pray that uh, we would pray this week in a way that definitely honors our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. 